mention, the first of which is, and this isn't how I normally dress, my day job, I wear a suit or a tie. I'm actually the director of enterprise data security for Paychex. And in my job, I get to use this equipment, which I've had an opportunity to bring with me, which I'll talk about. Also, as mentioned, I'm the current president of InfraGuard. And um, InfraGuard is actually a public-private partnership that was founded in 1996 at the leadership of the FBI out of their Cleveland office. And so the FBI agents at the time, who I do not represent, but I do get an opportunity to work with them, the special agents realized that there was a, a better opportunity in the community to get more information from the local community, from the businesses that are operating there, the educational institutions, and to be able to act on that and at the same time deliver some uh, relative, relevant information to the community that might help them to better protect themselves. So... Um, I'm an Eagle Scout, which is why I believe in stepping up and helping. So that's a part of the reason why I joined in the Imperguard is a little bit of volunteer. So I'm trying to give back to the community with respect to technology and helping to protect it. So that's why I'm in the role that I'm in with Imperguard. However, we are looking to uh, bring in some new board members and uh, some new officers into that organization. So now's a good opportunity if you're thinking of looking for another way that you can help to give back to the community above what you already do. I was a little remiss during the opening session when they asked if it was a first time uh, meeting for anybody. I was booting up the laptop. It's my first time meeting, KC0QAH, so first time here. Um, so I, I have a lot of different hats that I'm wearing tonight. And then the last hat that, that I'm here beyond the InfraGuard one is this technical surveillance countermeasures um, presentation. So uh, just to close on, on InfraGuard, it's free. Uh, we try to meet at least once a month. We try to bring in um, a variety of topics, both physical security and cyber security. We have our special agents present from time to time. And then we have local um, business leaders actually present as well. So no cost to join. You can go out to FBI.gov. You can follow a link from there to get to the InfraGuard enrollment form. And then uh, they do a little bit of background vetting, and then they bring you into the organization. So. This presentation I've delivered a couple of times. Uh, technical surveillance countermeasures. So is um, was presented at the start. There is an opportunity to use. Go ahead, I guess. Okay, okay. <laughs> there is an opportunity to use electronics in a bad way, and the role that I play at, at Paychex is to try and detect when electronics are being used in a bad way. I either try to do that through computers to see whether or not somebody is using our computers maliciously or there's suspicious traffic or they're trying to do something that they shouldn't be doing in our environment. And I also use a variety of technical surveillance countermeasure equipment to take a look at our executives' offices, at boardrooms, meeting rooms, areas where special topics are being discussed that we might not want to have outside of the company until it's appropriate to do so. And also in the event that we've had a break into one of our facilities to go out and sweep and see if somebody left something behind that doesn't belong there. So I'm representing the detection side of it. With that said, attendance here is consent to audio and video. You guys are used to being online speaking all the time anyway, so you know that your conversations can be recorded. Uh, I have had the opportunity to tune in some hams from time to time using this equipment. I've picked up some morse with it. I've also heard some of the voice conversations with it. So when you're online, you can be captured. So this is just obvious that that could happen during the course of the presentation. It's only for demonstration purposes, though, for me. Um, I do say here that it's, it's prohibited. It's not. It's being recorded tonight. That's fine. And the last comment I have is I've purposely separated my views and opinions from my employer so that I can auction them online. <laughs> like I said at the start, I normally wear a suit and tie. I'm not here representing my employer. I'm actually here to talk about some of the equipment that they've uh, provided me with the opportunity to use. So I ask you to keep the two of them separate. Federal and state law. It's important to understand there are some things out there with respect to wiretapping, eavesdropping, and pretexting that prevent you from using monitoring devices against individuals without their consent. And if you think that you want to start to use any of the technologies that you have or you're aware of somebody that's using the technologies that you have access to in that fashion, you might want to advise them that's not a cool thing. So really what you want to tell them is you want to think about what you're going to say to a judge if you're, perform, if you're found performing any of these acts. And then the other thing you might want to come up with is a cool jailhouse moniker because you'll need one if you're caught. Um, not a good idea. I'm going to actually step over here and have you guys look at the slides instead of me right now. <laughs> um, if you want some additional detail about the laws that are out there, a couple of resources, the National um, Conference of State Legislatures, as well as the federal laws, there's a lot of coverage out there about what's appropriate. Brass tacks, terms and definitions. One of the things that I'm going to love about tonight's presentation with you all is I don't have to talk about electronics. 
there's some slides in here that talk about electronics. And in the past, I've had to go through, like, okay, this is an electron and how it spins. And you, I don't have to do that, I hope, here tonight. I get the gist that you guys already know how to spin up electrons and pump them out. We're going to cover a few other terms, though. We're going to talk a little bit about surveillance, technical surveillance, and then technical surveillance countermeasures. So surveillance, it's actually a French term, and its um, definition is watching over. It's a monitoring of behavior and activities of groups and peoples, and, and it's also intended to influence, manage, direct, or protect peoples, to survey. And so you can use it to influence the outcome of a group, or if you want, you can use it to also protect a group. Technical surveillance is the use of electronic or technical measures to monitor the communications. And there's a number there, audio, video, computer transmissions of the surveyed. And really, technical surveillance is observation at a distance. It's from a distance. <clears throat> I don't have to be present in the room. I can leave a recording device. Anybody here have a smartphone on them or a phone? Right? How hard is it to dial a number outside of the room, leave the phone in the room, and go listen to the conversation in the room after you've left? Real simple surveillance. So technical surveillance countermeasure is using a variety of equipment to detect when you're being surveyed. That's simple. There's not much more to it. Who uses TSCM? Our own federal and local government, our own law enforcement, military, corporate security, protection details, and private investigators all use it. When is TSCM used? Here's some of them, right? Personnel report strange clicking or noises on a telephone line. Personnel know more than they should about various topics. Competitors are releasing identical products and suspicion of surveillance after watching a spy movie. That's my favorite. I always get people coming back in saying, hey, I just saw spy games, and I'm worried somebody's you know, monitoring me right now. I always tell them to buy some aluminum foil and wrap it around your head. <laughs> so uh, where is it used? Again, it's used wherever sensitive confidential data is transmitted, processed, or stored. And these are some examples. I'm not going to go through all of them. Automobiles present a challenge from a TSCM perspective because they're just one massive antenna. I mean, it's really difficult to figure out if anything's truly transmitting out of it or if it's being uh, reflected off of it. And so short of taking it out into the middle of a field that you've actually swept in advance that's fairly free from signal transmission, it's very difficult to tell uh, if somebody's placed a GPS tracker on there, other than the usual locations where they put them behind firewalls, under the dashboard, by the glove compartment, underneath the seat, underneath where the, the wheel wells are, usual places where you can reach up inside real quick. One of the devices I didn't bring tonight is a video pole monitor, actually a video pole camera, and I've got a black and white and a camera attachment to it, so I don't have to keep bending over because I'm getting older now, but I can put that on and walk underneath the car with it real quick and see if somebody's placed one of those tracking devices underneath it. So it's used to protect secrets, right? Things that you don't want other people to know. Again, a long list. I'm not going to cover it. If it's not up there, um, I'll add it. But this is pretty much everything that we're trying to, to keep secret right now. Um, we talked a little bit, I was talking to somebody about, you know, competitive industrial espionage. That's a reality right now. We're seeing a lot of information coming out of the FBI as a part of that relationship through InfraGuard. They're providing a lot of information to us right now about some of the industrial espionage taking place around uh, the U.S. Real concerted effort to get in and take some of our secrets and use those to get a competitive advantage against us. And the same is true for industrial espionage. So uh, who fares TSCM? Um, so you got to consider who your opposition is and how badly they want to get to your secrets and what extremes they're going to go to to get to those. That's your opposition. So you got to kind of consider who wants to get to that information so that you know how to detect if they're trying to and how to protect it if they are. Um, real quick recap, I had this habit of telling you what I'm going to tell you, telling you, and then what I told you, and this is what I told you. This is what we talked about real quick. Is this a good pace for folks? I can really pick it up or slow it down? Okay. Science 101, why I should have paid attention in school. <laughs> Examine the EM. I don't have to go into a lot of detail there. The difference between sound and then sound over EM and then EM over wireless and wired medium. Differences between all of these. So this is me explaining technology to you. This is me assembling my grill at home. All right? I got confused while I was following these directions, so bear with me as I go through the next couple of slides. The EM. All right? So when you think about technical surveillance, you have to consider, and I'm going to share a little of this a little bit further, a little bit later into the presentation, talk to you about some of the things that you're looking for for technical surveillance. But you can't limit yourself just to something that's a free space transmission. 
that it could be hardwired. It could have been placed in advance. I mean, some of the things that I look for when I go out and do an inspection, I, I mentioned I have a VPC, a video pole camera. I'll pop ceiling tiles and I'll look up there for dead nine volt batteries. An indicator that somebody is swapping out a transmitter with a nine volt battery and leaving it behind. So it could either be a hardwired mic, which is going into another suite in a shared uh, facility, or it could be a free space transmitter. It could even be something in the um, invisible light, so like an infrared transmitter. And I brought some examples of each of those. As a matter of fact, I'll jump, I'll give you just a quick um, example of each of those. One of my favorite ones, I like to play cards. And so with respect to playing cards, it looks like a normal deck. And it doesn't take much, it's a nine volt, and it's not in there right now, I must have left it in the box. Am I gonna, I'm gonna get close to the, thanks. $30. This is a video camera with a mic on it. It operates off a of 9 volt. It doesn't have a very long run time, although I could go parasitic, uh, parasitic with it and tap a, a power source nearby. But if I want to do some real quick simple monitoring in a facility, I can actually stuff this inside. A lot of people will disregard the fact that it's anything other than a pack of cards. It has a simple hole in the end of it, and I'm watching the entire conversation. Right? And then I also have audio. So I have the advantage of. So this is a free space. This, to which my battery is getting really faint on, this is actually infrared. So for a few dollars, you can go down to Radio Shack, you can buy an IR transmitter. You can put it in just about any device. Now, the difficulty with this is it's line of sight. But it's, vi it's actually, um, this isn't your, your traditional antenna, but with a simple mic connected to this, if I place this in a wall inside of a meeting, in a room that has a glass wall for a conference, which most of the conference rooms in corporate America have a glass wall associated with them. And this can actually be um, recorded outside of the, the room itself. One of the ways that, uh, quick trick for those that have a droid, um, this is a really easy thing to detect with a droid, believe it or not. You can pull your camera out, you can walk around a room, turn the lights out, makes it a little bit easier, and you can actually see an IR transmitter versus what looks like a standard, uh, just a standard, um, light emitting. So, and then the last one, real simple, this one doesn't have a mic associated with it. Just a book left behind, I could put the mic on the edge of it. And instead it's actually carved out, and again, another simple nine volt transmitter. So these are all examples of things that you could find. I found, um, some of the other things I typically find are folks that are using old technology. Um, some corporations still allow their employees to use 900 megahertz uh, analog headsets. And those are great to tune into and listen to. So again, don't limit yourself uh, when you're doing this just to looking for free space transmissions. They could be hardwired, and I'll talk to you a little bit in a couple slides about how to find some of the hardwired ones also. So, um, as an exercise with some of the other folks, I asked them just to list on a sheet of paper as many electron electromagnetic signals as they can think of that are present in the room right now, just to kind of get a sense of who understands what EM is, and I ask them for some examples. And these are some of the ones that I thought about uh, almost every time that I give a presentation, I guarantee you I can find this signal in proximity. Right, so we've got uh, Wi-Fi signals, if there's any kind of 802.11. I, I actually saw some 5.8. I wasn't tuning into 2.4 gigahertz on the spec AN, so I wasn't looking for it, but I probably could find it uh, in this area. So telephone, television, radio station, Bluetooth, monitors, these are all things that are constantly going through. And then I asked the question about voice. Is voice EM? It's not. So EM, radiation of photons, it's actually, sound is produced by pressure variations. It's produced by pressure variations that can transmit through air like you're hearing right now. But it can also go through water, it can go through gas, it can go through solids. The difference between EM and sound, again, continuing, medium is free space, but the, the, um, the difference between the two, let's see, velocity travels at the speed of light, it's limited by the medium. Hypothetically, it's infinite for electrons, limited by the medium again, and EM can traverse a vacuum unless it's a Dyson. But I'm um, Whereas voice cannot tra traverse a, an actual vacuum. The thing about voice, which is really cool too, is this building likely has beams in it, steel beams, Voice will actually travel faster across a steel beam than it will across through air, right? And so I think it travels at, I don't know if I have it in here. Uh, yeah, 18,996 feet per second across steel. 
Again, one of the things that I use to see if I can hear conversations that I don't want to hear if I go to check out a facility, if I'm trying to operationally secure it, I'll actually attach to some of the steel beams to hear if I can hear the conversation in somebody's office or inside of their conference room to figure out if that's you know, an OPSEC uh, secure room to have a good conversation in. So the difference between the sound and EM is for, for technical surveillance, you're taking sound and you're attaching it to some medium, right? So you're modulating that sound over EM, and that's what you're looking for. Uh, quick pick of the wireless communications technology. So in here, I know you can't see it from the back, it's an eye chart, but you've got everything from IRTA to WiMAX to Wi-Fi to radio to, I mean, it's all up here. This is what the communications spectrum looks like. Um, I use this slide just to kind of give you a sense. If you're a TSCM person, you can't limit yourself to any um, particular platform or technology because if I'm searching for a phone today, that phone's already outdated. That, if I'm looking for that particular 1.92 or 1.8 or 1. If I'm looking in those ranges that you typically find some of the phones transmitting or the 8s or the 900 uh, megahertz, um, you've probably outdated yourself already. So this is just looking at Nokia's technology from 1982 all the way up to current, or 2006 on here. But... Um, You've got to constantly be changing your skills and looking for whatever the current transmitter is. Um, again, sound over EM, I don't have to talk about that. I hope folks are, are comfortable. So regardless, wireless or wired, the electromagnetic spectrum typically underlies surveillance technologies. TSCM requires a broad understanding of the spectrum and working knowledge of radio waves. And that's our frequency allocations here in the U.S. So if you travel internationally, don't get comfortable with just this because you might also have to look at a different range. It's, diff it's managed differently outside of the U.S. This is what we covered. So surveillance technologies limited by time, talent, and treasure. Some additional examples of uh, surveillance technologies, buy versus build, characteristics, and then types, advantages, and disadvantages of some of the surveillance technologies that are out there. I will move kind of quick through some of these. So technology, technology threats, they can either be purchased commercially What's the difficulty or what's the downside to purchasing a commercial one? Like that camera I showed you. It's traceable, too. Everybody got, they have them, they can get to them. I know what they operate on for a frequency. They're not as easy to hide, but they're readily available, and I can use them and burn them. I don't need them. I just wasted 30 bucks, and I heard the whole conversation that I wanted to, then so what? Uh, the homemade one, though, slightly more expensive. They can be time-consuming to assemble, component-based, ready to be shipped. The, the, here's the difference, too, and this is funny. I went to Radio Shack to buy a variety of components so I could put together one of the IR transmitters that I had. I always stop short of attaching a mic because that's on the border. Unless I have permission to monitor, I usually don't attach a mic to it. So I went up to the counter, and I had a breadboard, and I had the, the transmitter, and I had the, the connector for the um, battery. I had some wires, and the uh, individual behind the counter looked at me and said, what are you building? And I'm like, all right, any Radio Shack employees in here? Not in a bad way. They're not, so here's the difference, and I'm not going to slam them. I'm going to say they're not as good today when you build technology as when you buy pre-built technology. They can describe to you computers and the other things, and phones especially, that they sell in the store. They can run circles around you. But when it comes to building something from the ground up, not always as knowledgeable. Not, I mean, some of them very, are, very much so. I ran into one that was knowledgeable. And I looked at him and I said, well, you tell me. You go ahead and tell me. And he's like, IR transmitter, wires, you're building infrared transmitter. I'm like, wow. So, I was impressed. I mean, yeah, so I totally got smoked. I thought, I thought there was no way he would know what, I, know what I was doing. The point, though, is I could buy those individual components from a lot of different uh, locations and assemble it, and you wouldn't necessarily know what it is that I'm building. And so it's a lot easier to build your own and hide it than it is to purchase one commercially because it's traceable. Device states. Uh, so you didn't take that wrong, right? Did you say you were a Radio Shack guy? I didn't. Oh, okay. Um, device state, passive versus, versus active. The passive one is very difficult. Um, so if I go in sweep and somebody has decided or they recognize, like you see a guy rolling in with what looks like a big black case. I always tell people it's my, my ventriloquist dolls. Um, it kind of is a tip off, right? So they could turn that device off and make it so that I don't know that it's being monitored at that time. So it's always point in time when you do a sweep. If it's uh, active and they're continuously monitoring, it's easier for me to detect. Power, it could be self-sufficient or parasitic. Transmission, it could be hardwired, RF. And then heat actually produces a heat. So I didn't bring it. Um, 
One of the things that I need to pick up is I've been looking at the FLIR uh, heat signature uh, for uh, infrared so that I can actually scan a wall and see whether or not there's something in there that's radiating. I don't have one yet. Hardwired microphones, no emanations. I can't find a hardwired microphone. I'll tell you what I can find with a hardwired microphone sometimes. Uh, so it's very difficult. I am turning everything over. I am looking at everything inside of the room to figure out if somebody's put a hardwired mic in there. Uh, advantages to me, so the way you read this slide, the disadvantages to me are those that are up above. Right? These are all the disadvantages to me. The advantage to me is typically a hardwired mic requires a physical link to an active listening post. So if I do find it up against an edge that's a shared office space and I find a wire, then I know that I can trace it to that location. So it's, it's actually advantageous to me if they're using a hardwired mic. But it does require considerable time on target, and I can tip them off to the fact that I'm searching. It's very noisy or loud when you're looking for one of those things because you're moving everything in the room. Um, audio recording devices, disadvantages. Again, so there's advantages and disadvantages to it, and you've got to look at it more from the disadvantage to the TSCM specialist. It's very easily disguised and installed. It's very, it's very difficult, right? Again, a meticulous search. Advantage. It must be retrieved. So if they left that smartphone on the table and walked out of the room, unless they're recording it remotely, they got to come back in to get their smartphone. Right? They got to come get, to get that device again so that they can get whatever it was that they recorded. Battery life is limited as well. RF devices, easy to disguise, easy to install, readily available. Advantages to me, again, power consumption, battery life, ambient signal environment. What are those things competing with within that space? Sometimes you have to boost the power on those, and by boosting the power, they tip their hand. Uh, devices out of installer's control and transmits RF signal. Carrier current as well is another way to get out. I actually wrote a paper on, on this quite a while ago. It's not the quality that I would like to have produced, but you know, walking into an office space, plugging in these um, power, this Ethernet over power connectivity, and, and attaching it to an enterprise network, and then going outside of the facility and being able to tap into it. Another way to get onto their network. Laser listening devices, very costly. That's all that James Bond stuff. You don't see a lot of that. Infrared devices I spoke about, clear line of sight. Video chip cameras, those are easily, to, easily embedded in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different um, items around the room. And then telephone attacks and threats. I didn't bring it. I have a device, a Talon, a telef uh, telephone line analyzer. I didn't bring it with me tonight. Uh, the, the Talon actually allows me to tap into 56 different codecs. So if it's a PBX that's running a digital signal, I can actually decode those and listen to the conversations that are taking place and see if anybody's transmitting on the, on the line or if there's anything suspicious about it. Um, I find a voltmeter to be very beneficial when I'm doing any kind of telephone analysis, actually running the block and seeing where I've got current that doesn't belong or if I've got um, you know, mismatch, mi mix, mismatched pairs uh, is another example of something that I could use a voltmeter for. So you don't need a lot of expensive equipment. You can just use a simple $5 Harbor Freight unit or a free one and, and still find things uh, with that. That's what we covered. Tools of the trade, the fun part. All right. I try to categorize. I, I like to use um, analogies. I, I like to use things that we might be comfortable with to explain some of the the terms or, or some of the, the concepts of it. In this case, I tried to look at TSCM as kind of like a guild, right? So you've got your apprentice, and it's probably very similar to the, to the way that we're structured as amateur radio, right? It's that, you know, you get that base level of knowledge, and then as you move up and you go up in licensing, you have additional skills and tools, and then um, the same is true for the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master craftsman from a TSCM perspective. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with medieval guilds, that's simply what the slide is saying, is what a medieval guild operates as. Um, but really, if we start to take a look at some of the tools that an apprentice might be used to, a physical search is probably the number one. Right? Uh, you're really ransacking, you're going through the environment, and you're tipping your hand as you're doing that. That's the difficulty. nice thing about using the spectrum analyzer or spec an is I'm not letting them know necessarily that I'm looking for them transmitting things and seeing if I can tune it in. Versus a physical search, you start moving things around, Mics are real sensitive. I mean, you're hearing every little bit of noise in there, and they start to get an idea of that's what's taking place. Voltmeter, I mentioned. Tone generator, that's not right. Tone generator, um, it was tone loke, sorry. I uh, know, bad. Um, fox and hound, folks familiar with fox and hound? 
right? All right. Audio source, and audio source is a really cool part of the job as well. You get to bring your own music. Any ideas why bringing your own music is a good thing? You can recognize it. So I'll take my smartphone. I've got a lot of different music on here. I've been listening to a lot of Mumford & Sons lately, so I'll, I'll slap it on the table of a room that I suspect. I'll walk outside of that room and see if I can tune in that sound. And on the spec end, I'll see a spike in transmission, typically, because now there's actually audio over. I've got a waterfall capability on here, and so I'll see the, the spike in the waterfall and know that there's something I want to go take a look at inside of that room. A camera to take pictures, the toolkit, uh, you have to have the toolkit, it comes in handy. You're constantly uh, removing wall jacks and you're looking behind light switches and you're taking table legs off and you're, so you have to have a toolkit so that you can take things apart. Uh, you can't really take things at face value. Uh, borescope, stud finder, patch and repair kit, an ultraviolet marker, an ultraviolet flashlight, and a ladder. So the patch and repair kit actually is, um, if you're opening things up, you're poking holes, especially if you have a borescope. Like, you don't want to tell your CEO, hey, I'm going to sweep your office. They come in the next day, and you've got like 40 holes in there. You know what I mean? Because you've gone in there with a borescope, and you're looking behind the wall. They won't be happy. So you might have to patch things up. Ultraviolet marker. I actually have a, a UV marker and a UV flashlight. Good to have to let me know that I've actually checked out a wall. So I can actually put a quick note on it to say this was inspected by me on such and such a date. And then somebody else coming along can actually run the flashlight on it and see whether or not you were there. It's also a good way to leave notes uh, if you want to spy on people. So, um, and then the ladder, because you're going to spend a lot of time up in the ceiling. If you move up into the journeyman level, then you start to use some of these other tools. So a broadband counter surveillance probe, the first one, the CPM. This is the CPM right here. And it comes with a whole bunch of different antennas. It has uh, what they call a BPM, which is good for microwave. It'll actually help you to find um, your Wi-Fi signals transmitting. Uh, you get a constant chirp with that a when you're onto something. This actually has an a, um, infrared. Uh, it has an infrared with a 40-degree range on it, a sweep range on it. So versus the smartphone, we almost have to be dead on with a droid to see that actually broadcasting at you. With a 40-degree sweep range, I don't have to be exactly on that signal. It'll actually start to, to, to give me tone to let me know that it found something. Um, and this doesn't always have to tone either. It depends on how you're using it. This nonlinear junction detector, which I'll talk about in a second, I like the tone. This one, I like to see the signal. I actually like to see the signal strength go up, and this actually has an LCD screen on it, and you'll see it actually going up as you're getting close to something that's transmitting. Um, so it's got a bunch of different types of antennas and connectivity. I can actually use that. It's got, I've got a breakout box for uh, connecting to a, uh, either a network jack or a phone jack to see if I'm picking anything up there as well. It has a um, VLF probe. This is if I want to see if there's any kind of um, transmission carrier current transmission. This will tell me if somebody's using a baby monitor, something real simple as a baby monitor, or some of the more Ethernet over power uh, type tools that are out there. So that's where you start to use something that's a little bit more sophisticated. It takes some orientation to using it, which we'll talk about. Um, but once you've got it, you're good to go. The NLJD, the nonlinear junction detector, this helps me to find electronics that aren't actively transmitting. This is actually a transceiver. It puts a signal out, and I'm going to get a couple of different harmonics back. If it's a second harmonic that I'm seeing, and I had a discussion with somebody that's a musician about what a first, and a, you know, a fundamental and a secondary. And a, but the way this operates is it's looking for the secondary harmonic from its initial or its fundamental frequency that it puts out. If it gets a strong second harmonic back, it is leading you to believe that that's an electronic. Not always the case. But it's, it's telling you if it's found a transistor, if it found a semiconductor, if it found something that has a PN junction inside of it. It's letting you know that that PN junction is there and something to investigate. But you can get false positives with that as well. If you get a third harmonic, it could be something that somebody left behind in the wall. It could be steel wool. It could be that they've got steel beams or aluminum beams inside of the wall. It could be the wiring behind the wall if there's any AC in there. So something that's really noisy when you hear a TSCM inspection going on and they're using NLJDs is you'll hear a lot of tapping. And what they're doing when they're tapping is they're going along. Um, I tend to use my fist, but then after a while you get tired of tapping. Is if I get a third harmonic, um, that's something possibly, it's a, it's a, it could be a second, it could be an electronic, or it could be an electronic that they've uh, enveloped in something, right? So they've tried to mask it by putting it inside of some kind of steel wool so it's difficult for me to find. Or it could be something 
inside of the construction of it. And what I'm trying to do with a hammer is dislodge it and to see if I can get it to break away or separate to see whether or not it's a signal. And if I can't get a clear um, signal, if I can't determine with that, then I might be going in with a bore scope or something else to see what's in there. Uh, pole camera, as I mentioned, a TDR, time domain reflectometer, to see if there's any breaks in the line. A thermal imager and a portable x-ray. Don't have that. <laughs> Spec in and telephone line analyzer. I talked a little bit about both of those. It takes a lot more knowledge to, to use the spec and a lot more experience and time on it. So as you're moving up, you're learning more about the spectrum and understanding what you might find in certain ranges. When I run this um, spec in, you know, I might skip certain uh, bands because I'm going to right off the bat think that the FM band, I'll come back to it later, right? If it's, um, if it's a 2.4, I might spend more time on that seeing if I can find a camera. So it's all in how you uh, look at it over time. Um, how will TSEM specialists react if a device is found during an investigation? This is where you have to ask the individual before you go in there. Do you want me to exploit what I discovered and see if I can figure out who is tapping you or who is monitoring you? Or do you want me to simply nullify the threat? So if I come across an active device, do you want me to drop it on the floor and get rid of it? Or do you want me to leave it in place and try and see if I can figure out who's doing this? So really, you've got to kind of decide that before you begin your, your sweep. Uh, you want to have a checklist, but not a checklist mentality. So you want to know that this is all the gear that I brought and this is all the gear that I went home with because if you leave gear behind, you've tipped your hand. So you want to make sure that you have a good checklist and you're kind of proceeding through that checklist. But you don't want to use a checklist because if it says check all the power outlets and you check all the power outlets and you're working off this, this list, you're going to miss something. Um, make sure your equipment is accounted for. Okay, so talked a little bit about fixed versus mobile, taking a look at the cars, real PETA. Knowing the procedures, less alerting, more alerting procedures. These are different things to tip off whether or not you're doing a TSM sweep. All right, a little bit about the physical inspection. So the way I look at a, a facility and the way I look at individual rooms is I actually try and pick those up and spin them around in my head. I look at them as a six-sided um, box, and I try and look at everything coming into and out of that room. So as an example, in this room, if I were to pick it up and spin it around, the lights themselves, they have wires that can be used to actually get a signal out of the room. So I'm going to look at all of the wires that are going up out of the ceiling. You know, I see that we've got um, smoke detectors in here. We've got uh, actual physical lights that we can turn. So everything in here that has cabling coming out of it, I'm looking at all those individual cables to see if they're being used. Steel beams, as I mentioned. The walls, I'm looking at the, the radiator ducts because they could be used because they're uh, likely some form of metal that will transmit faster than, than air. I'm looking at all the wires coming into the walls. I'm looking at uh, the floor itself. And some of the things that I'm looking for as I go along, so we've got wires, cables, ducts, telecom jacks, thermostats, alarms, intercom speakers, telephones, computers, televisions, furniture, tape dispensers, staplers, personal fans, space heaters. These trophies would drive me crazy. Piles of books, works of art. Um, so the, the, all these trophies individually, I've, I've actually, through some of the training classes that I've been through, I've had an opportunity to work with stuff on individuals' desks, like decoy ducks and clocks and trophies. And it's amazing what you can put inside of these things and how difficult it is. And the reason why this would drive me crazy is because if it's not actively transmitting, I'll take the nonlinear junction detector, scan an area on the floor to make sure there's nothing actually transmitting underneath it so I've got a good dead spot, take the trophy, put it on the floor, sweep it, lay it on its side, sweep it. Turn it over, sweep it. That trophy's clean. Set it off to the side. Next trophy. Take a photo before I start moving trophies to make sure that I put the trophies back in the order that I found them in so it doesn't tip my hand. So this right here is, like, bothering me. Um, I don't even want to think about it. All right, so other things. Why am I standing in this room? You're looking for things that are out of order. Now, I mentioned that ultraviolet flashlight. Great tool for finding um, any kind of spackle. So if somebody's done any patch and repair, right? If they've actually replaced it, if there's any kind of dust from ceiling tiles, right? If it's not readily visible, like if they move ceiling tiles, you didn't do it. Another good way with a UV light to detect that. It helps you to find white um, particles really easily. And so that's what you're looking for, is you're looking for moldings with popped nails. You're looking for bits of electric wire, shielding, copper, or twisted braid. So if they tapped in, if they went parasitic, and they stripped wires and they left behind um, the components of it, you're looking for dead batteries I mentioned up above. You might be looking for a few different looking staples holding the material under a chair. 
So if they actually flipped the chair over and they removed some of the cloth and they embedded something in there and there's a couple bright shiny staples left behind as opposed to the rusty ones that were there previously, good indicator. Ceiling tiles, a jar, as I mentioned, double-sided sticky tape or Velcro under a desk or table surface. Smartphone, Velcro, under the table, walk away. So I might go in and see if I can feel anything. And again, I don't like to bend over a lot too often, so I'll take the video pole camera and look underneath and see if I see any Velcro. Good way to leave something behind. Shoe marks on walls or desk table surfaces if they climbed up above. So, and I mentioned the UV. Considering the threat, uh, internal versus external, on-site versus remote, fixed versus mobile, likely targets. So, uh, this I don't have to get into with you guys. This is all electronics. I mentioned a little bit about orienting yourself to the, um, the CPM, the counter probe monitor. Uh, the one thing you have to understand about antennas, I always tell folks that don't understand antennas, is the polarization, right? And so the easiest example I give to them is how many people have an FM or an AM uh, radio inside of their vehicle. Almost everybody does, right? What's the direction of the antenna? It's like this. What's the direction of the transmitting antenna? It's like this. They're aligned, right? But you see people, when they pull the CPM out for the first time, they got this like Harry Potter effect. I'm like, how do you know that the thing is transmitting in that you know, direction? So what you have to do when you do a sweep is you actually take an um, antenna from the CPM, and you're going to sweep it this way, and you're going to sweep it this way, and you're going to sweep it this way, because you're going to try and see if you can find which way the antenna is configured inside of that device, right? And then the other example I tell them, too, is when you think of a satellite radio, if you have it, how's that positioned on your vehicle? It's right on top, just like the satellites broadcasting down. So harmonics, we talked a little bit about. Inverse square law, uh, I call it the rule of duh, personally. Also, other people refer to it as the rule of 180. So if you're moving away from a signal source and it's getting weaker, duh, right? <laughs> so you got to turn yourself around and start walking towards where the signal is getting stronger. And you'd be amazed when you get into like dead spaces, when you're standing in the middle of the room going, I found it. I know I found it. I found it. You know, because you're going around in a circle trying to find that source rather than moving in a direction towards it. I mentioned hotspots dead. Path loss and demonstrations. All right, so this is what I mentioned before about looking at the indicator. This is what I'm looking at when I'm when I'm walking around, and it's um, you can use it in an audio fashion. I can also use it in a monitor. Let's say I tell folks no electronic devices before the meeting, no pagers, no smartphones, no phones of any kind. I want anything electronic coming into the room. I can actually duct tape this to the underside, put it in monitor mode, set it so that if anything is transmitting, when they walk up, this will actually alert. I can set it to either uh, non-audible, so I'll see a flashing light on it, so if it's in a silent mode, or I'll actually have an audible. And then that's where you're like, I thought I said no devices. And then they realize, oh, I forgot I had my, yeah. So um, you can use this in advance to operationally secure, or you can use it for an active sweep. And then I mentioned there was a ton of different antenna types. You've got the RF WIP and the range, the sniffer and the range, uh, the BMP, infrared. These are all the different uh, types that you can actually attach to it. Car, uh, car before the horse, electronics, semiconductors, nonlinear. I mentioned transceiver, transmits, receives, and it's looking for that second harmonic to tell me if it's electronic. And this is what it looks like actually when I'm doing it. I'm looking for the, the red. There's an audible as well that I could use. <coughs> the thing about the nonlinear junction detector, too, is, is uh, you don't want a couple of people with NLJDs walking around a room like pointing it at each other because it's a transmitter. And so you're cooking each other at the same time that you're trying to, you could actually bump into each other and not know who you're, um, what you're picking up. So usually this needs to be um, tuned. The sensitivity has to be set on it based on what it is that you're trying to search. Here, I'd probably increase my, my output on it uh, to a high if I was trying to actually penetrate through this to get a signal on the other side, or I might tune it down if I'm going through wallboard. Um, I actually had a friend ask me recently to go out and, and give them a hand taking a look at their house. They had some questions, and they were amazed as we were going through the sweep. I actually found their um, Christmas presents that they had hidden from their spouse or from their significant other. They had put them inside of their closet. I had the sensitivity on this thing down to like 20-something percent. And I said, what's on the other side of the wall here? I'm getting something. And all their computer equipment was over there, and their Wi-Fi antenna was over there, and they had, they had speakers. I'm going through it, and I'm like, you've got something in here. And then finally, they're like, oh, yeah, and they moved a couple of sweaters and pulled out a box, and there was a shaver. It was a shaver, but it had uh, electronics inside of it. 
And so because of that, I was able to find it with the nonlinear. And then um, I mentioned, uh, you know, prep, select mode, adjust power, calibrate with sample. You can't see this example. That's actually Danielson. So I always tell people the use of the nonlinear junction detector. I put a um, buffing pad on this. And I'm recognizing the time. I'm trying to hike it, go a little faster here. So only a couple slides left. But I put a, an actual um, buffer pad on this, a 10-inch buffer pad. Because otherwise, all you're hearing is a scraping on the wall all night long. It'll drive you crazy. So instead, I, I don't hear anything when I'm scraping back on, and forth on the wall. And then I always tell people, show me paint the house, lock wrist, side, side. Show me paint the fence, up, down, look eye, always look eye. So you're looking at this. On here, you're looking to see whether or not you're getting a strong signal, and you're literally sweeping. I'm sorry, you're looking on this, you're studying on this, you're looking on this, and you're actually looking for the signal, and you're going back and forth this way, and then you're going up and down. And you want to do a quick pass, usually take a UV, mark where you think you had a hit, and come back. Because what will happen to you when you're doing it, at least initially, is you'll get one little signal, and you'll stand there all night, like trying to search for that one little signal. So you quickly sweep the walls, and then you mark where you think you may have found something, and you come back and spend a little bit more time with it. And then the Oscar green, finally. Uh, I have here that this is 30. You can with the Oscar blue, but it's ITARD, meaning it's, it's got some restrictions against export, and it has to be controlled because of the, the range of the technology. But this is actually 100 kilohertz to 24 gigahertz, and multiple functions. It's got an O scope on it. It's got a uh, subcarrier. Um, I can actually demod uh, AM, FM, TV. I can display TV. I can capture the image. I can record the audio. Um, one of the, the times that I found somebody using a 900 megahertz headset, I was able to record that and play it back and say, is this you? Because I'm listening to you. And usually that's pretty good evidence when they don't believe that you can listen to them, when you can hear their own voice. Um, the way I typically do this is, is take traces. So I'll take multiple traces. I'll take traces of signals outside. I'll collect so many passes of this on the full 24 gigahertz range. I'll take those passes outside of the building. I'll take passes inside of the building. I'll do simple math. You know, um, A minus B, and I'll take the strongest signals and then I'll tune into those and spend time trying to see if I can find those. Uh, relative signal strength I mentioned as well. If the signal is being transmitted within that room, I can actually use this to correlate and locate with it also. You can do the same thing with a CPM, but more so with a spec in. That's what the screen looks like. It has a sweep and an analyze mode, so I can continuously sweep, and then once I get to a point where I want to look at a signal, I can analyze. So, in the end, you should have learned how to stop worrying and love technical surveillance countermeasures. Uh, that you get what you pay for. This was free. Um, a general understanding of terms associated with it, some of the electronics and some of the tools. An opportunity to try professional grade. So if you do want to come up and have conversation or questions about it, uh, we can fire up some of the gear and use some of the samples that are up here. I'm more than willing to say for those that want to hang out for a while. Uh, and that's me. Not that it matters. But I got some like stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Not at all. So if you were to come into a room like this in, in, in advance of a high level meeting, how long would it take you to actually check this room out? Hours, days, weeks? What's it take? A couple hours. Really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, there's the yeah. No, so, so the cool thing about the spec in is, again, right now I get, like, I've got it tuned in to 96.5. Um, I mentioned the subcarrier portion of it. And so any FM module, you know, if you've got an FM transmission, you, let me be careful of this. So if it's a broadcast radio FM transmission, uh, they've got the subcarriers, right? Pilot light, um, broadcast, uh, language broadcast. So they've got the subcarriers. So you know, I can tune into all of those and sweep. So with this thing, I can sweep a whole range of frequencies and get comfortable whether or not I see anything. I can also take traces, and then I can come back in the room when the conversation begins and see deviation against the traces. So like with the waterfall, the waterfall capability on this, when I turn it on, I can see the strongest signals in the room. And then if something turns on that wasn't there, I'll see it instantly on the waterfall. And so I take a couple hours to sweep it and get comfortable with it. Uh, depend because th this will drive you crazy. You could. It's a great question. You could spend days. Um, Gene Hackman in the conversation. I don't know if folks remember the uh, the movie with Gene Hackman in the conversation. It was um, Cindy. What was her name there? Cindy Williams was in it, and she, he was actually a 
a monitoring specialist, and he was hired to record a conversation that she was having with somebody else, and they were conspiring on something. In the end, and he was he was known. He was a he was the professional guy. You went to to Harry Call was his name, and in the end, Harry Call they actually bugged him. They put something in his room. He got a phone call at the end of the movie. He could hear him playing the sax in that recording. They played it back and just said, you know, let it go, Harry. We're, we're paying attention. We're listening to you. And then you could hear him playing the sax. The rest of that movie is him destroying his apartment, tearing up carpet, floorboards, taking down the walls. He broke the statue of the Virgin Mary in half trying to see if he could find it. He couldn't find the bug. So there's a reasonableness to it. So you suggested then, which was what you just said, He'll sweep an empty room, and then when a meeting starts, he'll sweep it again to see if something's been activated. Yeah. Would you actually then stop a meeting and say, this room isn't secure? If that were to happen, yeah. I would suggest that we conclude our business. Okay. Yeah. What about cell phones? Can't de I can't demod. Right, I can't. Uh, well, with this equipment? Yeah. Um, because some of the, uh, so if you look at CDMA, if you look at Sprint, um, you can't because it's encrypted. GSM is a different story. GSM, because the way GSM fires up, at least in its current iteration of it, the protocols themselves, I can actually set up a, a bogus GSM satellite. And the way they, uh, the communication hierarchy works is GSM is constantly negotiating for the best signal strength and the best protocol in use. And so I can intercept that during the negotiation and then listen, eavesdrop into that conversation during that process. CDMA is a little bit more difficult. It is encrypted. GSM is supposed to be encrypted as well. So, but to do the first, I would have to spoof a GSM um, satellite. I would have to, not a satellite, but a, an actual uh, cell tower. I would actually have to spoof the GSM cell tower is what I meant to say. But what you're saying is the government actually can't do that? Or what's going on? I can't speak for those guys. But they must have. I, I, yeah, I don't know. So. And yet with radiation, the um, broadcast radio... TV, share, well, communications. I, I assume, I mean, that's in the room, too. I, I assume you probably know that out, and you have the signature of that, and you know that out, and, and, and what would prevent someone from using, uh, operating on those channels? Great question. So, for those, everybody heard the question, so all the ambient noise in here. So, to your point, why wouldn't somebody just use 96.5, right, and try and... So, um, what I'll do is set up signals of interest, signals that I believe that I won't rule any signal out. I just, I, I won't do that. I might loop back to it if I see that it's increased, but like 96.5 is so strong in here that you would have to have quite a lot of out, you'd have to increase the wattage to actually overcome that. So it would be unlikely that would be a quick red flag. You'd see that on the, the spec end. Um, some of the other ones though, some of the lower frequencies, again, there's no perfect answer for that. I try not to rule any signal out. And usually what I'll do is keep it, this has the ability for me to type signals into it, signals that I've discovered. And so I can, I can not back those signals out but not pay attention to them, if you will. I mean, they're still present. Uh, I actually keep a scratch pad where I'm writing down signals that I've discovered on those. Um, but if I see an increase in strength, that'll catch my eye and I'll go back to see why I'm seeing an increase in strength, a deviation from what I recorded as the initial trace. I have no industrial espionage detection. What? I have none. I have not detected any actual industrial espionage. What I've mostly detected are, are um, either well-intended employees using ancient technology um, is the, the typical find because they do that in the corporate space. And if you have spouse on spouse, you know, bugging or monitoring, uh, sometimes you'll be lucky enough to come across that. But I haven't yet. And so that's the, the whole um, foil cap kind of thing. There's a reasonable to this as, this to this as well. So I haven't found anything any active, and I hope I never do. Yeah. That's a good question. Well, that unit, uh, distinguish uh, Help me understand. Uh, I can find relative signal strength. So I can actually correlate and use relative signal strength. So if, if there's two, if I understand you right, 
let's say there's two contending frequencies in this room. Um, if they are near identical, uh, unless I walk up to them, so inverse square law, I would have to walk up to them to figure out which one was the one that I was more interested in. Not every oscillator is exactly the same. True. No, I can't get a fingerprint of the, to your point. That's a great question. Yeah, no, I can't get an exact fingerprint because you're right, they do. They, they, they're different. So, at least not with this. There's a lot of other types of equipment that, that are out. I mean, you can purchase a bench O-scope for 50, 60, 70. This unit here is about 30. So you could get a bench uh, with a, a different array of antennas. This has seven in here. So you can get a stronger, um, you know, an amplified with an O-scope and truly tune it in and get that trait. I'm not going to get that signature with this unit. This isn't for... Go you know what I was trying to say. Absolutely. You yeah. No, you, I, I get it. I know what you're saying. They, they have a... The best term I can use is a fingerprint to them. Yeah. Hopefully this was interesting or, or helpful to some degree. Uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity uh, for Gary helping to set this up, Jim for arranging it initially. Um, so saw Jim at the InfraGuard meeting. He said, come on in. Uh, our own Jim Stefano is actually on the InfraGuard. He's on the board uh, for the InfraGuard also. So consider that also. And I'll hang out, like I said, off to the side. Thank you.